Welcome. We're letting everyone flow into our Zoom room here, which is at capacity. We're also broadcasting this on a player page as well. And it's just so wonderful that we have so many people showing up from around the world to join Sounds True for this discussion with Dr. Jeffrey Rutstein on how narcissists affect us. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and it's a joy to be with you and an honor to be here with uh, my friend, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you've spent close to four decades as a clinical psychologist. You have an expertise in the area of trauma, as well as having a focus on helping people heal from the trauma of narcissistic abuse. You've been partnering with Sounds True now for several years. You've hosted our Healing Trauma Summits in the past, and we're partnering together to create a new nine-month training program on healing trauma. Its goal is to help people regulate their nervous system, embody safety, and become a healing presence. This is a nine-month healing trauma that begins at the end of January, and there's a Learn More button below the video player if you're interested in learning more. We have an early registration deadline that's coming up on December 14th, where there's a $200 savings on this nine-month intensive deep dive healing trauma program, and I welcome people uh, to learn more, and if you're interested, you can uh, you can register, you can apply before the December 14th deadline. All right, Jeffrey, let's talk about how narcissism affects us, and importantly, how to heal from the trauma of narcissistic abuse. To begin, share a little bit more about you, your professional life, and how this area of healing from narcissistic abuse became an area of focus for you? Well, since I've been treating trauma for so long, um, what I began to see in my practice over time was that, uh, especially with folks who had suffered extensive child abuse and neglect, is that one or more of their caretakers seemed to be very narcissistic. And one of the many signs of narcissism is uh, an inability or great difficulty in having empathy. And it sort of fits that people who are not empathic, can't feel into the experience of someone else, may end up hurting them instead. And so a lot of my survivors reported relationships that were tinged with lots of narcissistic qualities. And um, narcissistic abuse is, is a a kind of abuse unto itself. It's a type of emotional abuse, and it's very much confusing for the person who's undergoing it. And at first, as I was beginning to sort of formulate this relationship, maybe back in the 90s, um, it kept occurring to me that, you know, all trauma survivors have shame, but if they've had narcissistic parents, the shame is even more intense than just the enormous amount of shame that one has from trauma alone, just general trauma. And so I wanted to understand more about narcissistic personality disorder, uh, what makes that happen, and in particular, uh, the kinds of effects that happen when someone is in a relationship with someone who's a narcissist or has a lot of narcissistic characteristics. So that's how I sort of moved into also treating people who um, experienced only narcissistic abuse. But there's many, many people on my um, population, my clinical population, that have had all different types of abuse in the context of also having a narcissistic abuse experience. All right, Jeffrey, there's a lot in what you've already said. I think it would be helpful if you could define some of the terms here. So first of all, people, I've heard people, they say, you know, this person is a narcissist, my mother, my father, my ex-partner, my ex-boss, my uh, the current person I'm dating, I wonder. How would you define that? Just to begin, lay the groundwork. When you use that label, it's a big deal to use a label like that. Yes. When is it appropriate and when maybe is it not appropriate? 
Good question. Really good question. First of all, um, narcissism is on a continuum. All right. All of us have healthy narcissism. And then we can become more and more narcissistically preoccupied, have more and more narcissistic type concerns. And at the other end of the spectrum is what we have, what's called narcissistic personality disorder. And actually in that far end of the extreme is a very small group of people. I mean, it's, an, it's a lot, but it's, it's like we have many more people distributed throughout the whole spectrum. Uh, versus just at the end where someone warrants the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. But they can be personality traits in many, many, many people. And so uh, what are the traits? Like, let me give you the nine traits that we look for in narcissists. And according to current diagnostic criteria, for someone to be diagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder, the end of the continuum, they have to have um, five of the following nine criteria. So the first criteria is a grandiose sense of self-importance. Second one is preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Number three, a belief that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. That this individual requires excessive admiration. They have a sense of entitlement. They are interpersonally exploitive. They tend to take advantage of others. They lack empathy. They envy others or believes others are envious of him or her. And finally, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors and attitudes. Now, if you have five of those or more, you would be officially be able to be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. Most people, most of the um, narcissists that people will meet day to day are the grandiose type. And these are the people who have an inflated sense of their self-importance, uh, they'll come across as arrogant, not very empathic, wanting or entitled to special treatment or a lot of airtime. They sort of are the person that likes to have a lot of attention on themselves. So I think uh, there's a, a small part of the population that has uh, narcissistic personality disorder, but there's a large section of the population that has any... Um, aspect of these traits, but they just don't have five or more of them. So if your boss or if your uh, romantic partner has one or more of these traits, um, then there's a chance that you're in a relationship with someone who has some strong narcissistic tendencies. I just want to differentiate this. That we're, most, we're most familiar with what we call grandiose narcissism. But there's another uh, type that we call vulnerable or covert narcissism. And this is not from people who seem like they know better or feel like they're entitled to more special attention than everyone else. It's um, kind of in reverse. They're actually self-critical, but in a way to actually try to engage you in taking care of them. Gauge, engage you to say, oh, no, you're not bad, or that was a great performance, or you did wonderful there. Um, but they always manage to still suck the air out of the room, even if it's just about their complaints. And frequently, there are other maladies that go along with covert narcissism. Frequently, there's some physical issues and physical health issues that the person constantly focuses on to the extent of being able to be as invested or connected to anyone else. A hallmark of a healthy relationship is that relationships can be reciprocal and mutual, right? We can give back to each other in a way that feels mutually supportive, and we're both giving and taking from the relationship 50%. It's reciprocal. It goes both ways. In general, one really quick way to know if you're in a relationship with a narcissist is whether it feels reciprocal and mutual. And most of the time, if you're in a relationship with narcissism, you'll find that it's much more about them than you. 
All right, so understanding this range, Jeffrey, is really helpful. And these nine traits, you need five or more to be considered someone who has narcissistic personality disorder. We'll go all the way on that side. Right. Now, people that are in this middle, maybe they don't have five traits. They have one, two, three. Maybe it's better to say they have narcissistic tendencies yes. than to declare this person is a narcissist. This is more in the range. But then you said at the other end of this continuum is something that we could call healthy narcissism. Mm -hmm. And I think that brought up a question for me. What's happening at that end of the continuum and what makes it healthy? Well, healthy narcissism gives us a sense that uh, we're entitled to a good life. We're entitled to be happy. We're entitled to have some of our needs met. And it makes me feel okay about wanting to advocate for myself. If I'm in pain, to get pain relief. If I need assistance, to ask for assistance. That's a healthy level of narcissism, trying to take care of ourselves, acknowledging our needs, and trying to do something about them. Where narcissism gets in the way is if our promotion or advocacy for ourself, our self-investment becomes so great that we become incapable of or not interested in really investing in other people. By the way, um, the more arrogant classical kind of narcissist is usually very charming and at first will make people feel wonderfully taken care of. Matter of fact, early on in romantic relationships, people will say, if their partner is a narcissist, they treated me like I was a king or a queen of the world. They, they made me feel so seen and so loved and so special. And that usually lasts for a period of time until control struggles come up. And then when there's tension or stress in the relationship, you see someone with narcissistic tendencies then begin to become controlling, manipulative, angry, exploiting, unempathic, demanding their way or the highway in effect. And so you can go from feeling like you're on the top of the world to like you were just thrown in the dumpster. So that's oh. one experience. Okay, so let's talk for a bit now circling back to your own experience, clinical experience. You were describing how you've worked with people who have had parents who have narcissistic personality disorder five or more of these traits, and that one of the resulting impacts you've seen is that the person comes to therapy and they have to work through a lot of shame, if I understood you correctly. And yes. I wonder if you can help me understand that more, uh, why, why it is that someone growing up with a narcissist, a parent that's a narcissist, has to work through so much shame, and then how to work through it. Help me understand that, that whole arc. Okay. Um, just like people can be amnestic to severe trauma because it was so severe they don't remember it, they don't have an action to it, narcissistic abuse often isn't recognized because the brunt of narcissistic abuse is almost always, well, let me back up. Because narcissists have actually inside a very fragile sense of self, they do not handle or manage feelings of hurt or vulnerability well. So if they feel hurt or disappointed, they traditionally react in anger and they express their anger, not directly or cleanly, but through shaming the other person. How could you? After all I've done for you, you're the worst daughter or son in the world, whatever it is. And that narcissistic parents, because all parents get frustrated from time to time, narcissistic parents do too, or narcissistically oriented ones, but what they'll be doing whenever they get angry, upset, or hurt is to shame the people around them, often their children. But children who are ashamed don't ever think at the time they're being abused, they just become convinced that there's something wrong with them. They're shameful. There's something broken or ugly or unlovable in them. And so people don't even recognize that this was done to them. They're just left with this feeling that this is the foundational truth of me, that I suck, that I'm not a good person. And so it, it's so interwoven with their sense of self that they, they don't recognize that, A, it's a 
it's an infliction, it's a wound. And it's, it's actually was inserted there and amplified there by their parents. And that shame isn't who they are. So part of this is helping someone unknot how being abused by a narcissist confuses them, makes them feel bad, makes them feel worthless or wrong or stupid or too emotional or not adult enough, whatever it is. And it takes a little bit of a shift for people to begin to see, oh, I'm in shame. This is shame. This isn't actually about me, but this is where I always go whenever I think about having to do a big project or having a social interaction. Does that make sense? It does, Jeffrey. And just for a moment, I know you're Dr. Jeffrey Rutstein, but you're also my friend, Jeffrey. And I, I wonder if you could just speak personally for a moment. Your mother was a, a narcissist, someone with narcissistic personality disorder. Is that, is that true? I, I, yes, that's true. Can you share a little bit personally about your journey of working through the shame of that experience and what you learned firsthand working with yourself? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, my mother had some narcissistic tendencies and so, and she also had depression. And so when she got more depressed or more angry or more hurt, she would tend to express things at times in very shaming, angry, or hurtful, hurtful ways. Um, and, you know, for most of my life, I had thought that it was me. About my late teens, early 20s, I began to suspect that she might have had a hand in it. Um, but there wasn't really much written about shame and its impact on development back, back then. Um, as I started working through my own trauma, which I also experienced in childhood, uh, and then began to work on the shame around the trauma, which was specific around the types of trauma I experienced, I also discovered, though, that I had this overarching sense of shame that sort of touched into everything. And that's one of the insidious things about shame, is that if you've been abused by a narcissist, shame sort of colors your life. And so it colors how we look at possibilities for ourselves, how we feel about ourselves. So my shame was this background music that kind of limited me in terms of what I thought was possible or always feeling somewhat worried that I wasn't enough, I wasn't doing enough, I wasn't working hard enough. And it takes a long time and a good amount of work to heal from shame, but it's, it's so incredibly worth it. Because shame keeps you living only a part life, very separate from yourself, very separate from other people, feeling like you're masquerading or trying to show that you're good enough when you're hiding that you're not. And if people could learn that this is a, a horrible illusion created by the mind and that there's a way of working with it to get out of it, that they don't have to live or believe for the rest of their life that they are this bad, unlovable person. So for me, my own work has centered, I, I practiced uh, mindfulness and Zen for many decades and uh, a lot of self-compassion work uh, which neuroscience has showed us is actually quite helpful for when our shame circuits are highly sensitized, that one of the things we can work on, self-compassion, has a direct impact on helping reduce the intensity of the shame circuitry, of helping us not stay in it as long, not hate ourselves as much, and have it begin to encroach less and less into our life. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this whole theme of how narcissists affect us and healing from narcissistic abuse, our team at Sounds True is like, we, we need to put this webinar up during the holidays hmm. because it's especially relevant for many people during the holidays who want to be in connection, want to be in some form of loving, genuine connection, whether it's with parents, grandparents, or relatives or siblings, whatever, with people who are narcissists, but yet we want to be in connection at the same time. They're our right. family. It's our blood. What, what are your recommendations for that person? How do I have the right kinds of boundaries and yet be in connection? Can I be in connection? 
Well, let's actually, I want to answer that, but I want to start with a, a slightly related point, which is that people also often ask, can I heal the narcissist? Can I make them better? And can I help them if I'm in a really compassionate and present space? Can I help them be less narcissistic? And my first disappointing answer to that is that, no, you really can't heal a narcissist. Narcissists very, very, very rarely show up in therapy. And if they do, their complaint is usually everybody else. So they're not that interested in changing um, because of where they are right now. They don't experience pain um, as something they can approach and work with and heal. Even acknowledging the vulnerability feels too difficult for them. So when we go back into a family situation where we have one or more people with some narcissistic tendencies, it's really helpful to do some basic pre-planning, which is one, that you're not going to change them. Number two, you most likely won't get your needs met. And I know that that sucks, but that's just the truth. But if you go in with that, instead of the fantasy, maybe this time they'll know what a wonderful child or brother or sister I am and they'll love me, chances are that's not going to happen. But for your own safety, by lowering your expectations and by seeing someone with narcissistic tendencies for who they are, for their limitations, helps untangle this mess of, is it me or is it them? The other piece is that uh, narcissists frequently engage in conflict by saying something provocative. Oh, you never do that. Or, you always did that. Or, you know, you haven't called home in six months. Something that is provocative and is insulting or irritating to the other person. And so my advice, and this is really hard to do, my advice is not to take the bait. Because if you do, you start playing their game. Then you're just arguing with them about who's right and who's wrong and ultimately who's the worst person. And that's not a place you want to go. It's, you're not going to win that. It's never going to settle anything and it's not going to make anything better. So as best you can, don't take the bait when they're trying to provoke you into getting angry or defending yourself or talking about something that you don't want to talk about. Which leads me to another thing about pre-planning, which is have boundaries. Have boundaries because people with narcissistic tendencies don't tend to respect other people's boundaries. If I'm worried about something and I'm a narcissist, well, I'm going to make you worry about it too. I don't care that you're tired or sad or something else. I'm just going to lay on you all the stuff that's bothering me. And if now I want to talk about our family problem, well, darn it, we're going to talk about it now. And so having boundaries, having a sense of, what you're willing to do, or being able to take time where you go for a walk, you pull yourself apart from people, you go to a different room, where you can have some time to sort of de-stress a little bit and untangle. Because um, if you start getting into the traditional interactions with narcissistic family, you usually end up feeling kind of depleted, disappointed, and very frustrated. And the last thing is, is that um, if it gets too bad, you can always remove yourself for the whole duration of time, not just for a little bit. You don't have to sit and be in an environment that really is abusive. It's not healthy for you. That doesn't show your love to return home and be abused. Now, a lot of families aren't abusive. They're just difficult and challenging. That's a different situation. But if someone is actually verbally or emotionally abusing you, that's nothing that you need to put up with or sustain. You're allowed now, to leave that. Now, Jeffrey, just to ask a, a question about this. In, in hearing your description, you know, that you're never going to get your needs met, uh, that this narcissistic person will always make it about them and their agenda, and, you know, blow up the conversation. What, what quality of actual connection is possible? What's realistic? for someone to bring to a situation if they're dealing with some, you know, someone who's a narcissist. Can I be connected in some genuine way in the midst of all of that? Yeah, I do think it's possible. And again, it varies from person to person. There are some people with narcissistic tendencies who also are sensitive, right? 
most people with grandiose narcissism don't tend to be sensitive, interpersonally sensitive, sensitive to sliding other people's feelings. People who are more covert narcissists, more complaining about their illness or about the unfairness of life, they also tend to be actually a bit more sensitive. And there may be, with covert narcissists, some things that you could relate to that are genuinely and authentically real for both of you and to connect over that. But it wouldn't be their illness um, because that's, that's just a, a deep dive. Um, you can practice compassion for them, but they're going to be limited in how much they can see you and connect with you. Again, it may be around certain things, but you might have to find what they are. Okay, very good. Now, I want to let everyone know that you can ask questions directly. Uh, we received in advance lots of questions. We're currently receiving questions. If right now you'd like to add your question to the conversation, you can either put it in the chat, or if you're watching this on a player page, there's a button underneath the player page where you can submit your question. Now, Angela wrote in, what is the best way to protect children from a co-parent that is narcissistic? So that's a tough one, a very tough one. Um, and it also changes a, a little bit about whether you're still married to the parent who's co-parenting the children or whether you're separated from the parent. There's a bit more you can do if you're separated uh, because when you're having alone time with the child, uh, you can really talk about uh, their other parents' narcissistic tendencies. You can do that if you're still together as well, um, but it's also going to be uh, potentially creating some big conflict and blobs within the house itself. Um, one of the things that I would recommend that as a, a non-narcissistic parent that you offer the best caring and understanding you can to your child if uh, their parent has done something hurtful, rejecting, mean, exploitive, diminishing, unempathic, um, and your child obviously would be hurt and or frustrated by that, to talk to them about their hurt and frustration, that it would be natural to do that. Uh, you could say that mommy or daddy sometimes has a hard time um, feeling other people's feelings, but that's not your problem and there's nothing wrong with you. What you'd be trying to do is to give them some loving support and nourishment uh, that helps them feel not ashamed, that helps them feel like they're still loved, and helps explain that mom or dad lost their temper and reacted to this, not because of you, but because of them. Shame lands in us when we think and stay with, mom or dad said those things to me because of me. It doesn't ever naturally occur to a child that meanness from an adult could be coming from the adult. Uh, Jeffrey, we have Carol who's written in, is it unusual or usual for people who were raised by a narcissistic parent to end up with a narcissistic partner? It's very usual. Um, and again, I think there's two points to this. One is, is that growing up, if we've had a narcissistic parent, we know how to take care of other people because children of narcissistic parents often become parents to their narcissistic parent. And because of that, we're very good at caretaking and we know how to take care of others, especially narcissists. But here's where shame comes back in. Because of shame, because if you were raised with a narcissist, you definitely have shame. And if you have shame, you are not going to think that you're that entitled to be happy. You are not going to really think about what would make my life feel full, nourishing, satisfying, peaceful. And instead, we'll, we'll lower what we need or expect for ourselves and we'll make do. And again, narcissistic uh, individuals can be incredibly charming, romantic, and dazzling very early in the relationship. So it's not like they're saying, hi, I'm a narcissist, do you want to marry me? People fall in love. It's only when conflict and power struggles arise that you begin to see in the context of stress, uh, narcissistic tendencies emerge. Okay, I think, Jeffrey, this, this question um, 
in many ways is the, the crux of what I want to make sure we talk about. And it was uh, written in by Susan, who says, what helps people break the cycle of narcissistic abuse? She writes, I'm a daughter of a narcissist. I married two more. Mm. I worked for several as well. It took most of my life to learn that it's not about me and see and walk away from the signs. What helps people break the cycle of narcissistic abuse? I think there's two or three things that are really key in that. One thing is to see narcissistic abuse for what it is to see it, to actually label it. Because a lot of times in our minds, we don't label the abuse. We just sort of hold on to the idea that we suck. So part of it is to see what happened to you and to see how people have treated you in ways that weren't empathic or kind or connected. The other piece, and I just mentioned this again, but this is a, where shame comes in. So you could know that your parents were narcissists and you could know that you'd be vulnerable, right? But shame is still going to get you to limit your sights. It's going to get you to overlook some flags that would tell you this person is probably going to be narcissistically oriented too. Shame is the biggest driver of getting us to settle or put up with relationships because we're not sure that we deserve better. Okay. Now I want to make sure, Jeffrey, that we also talk about the workplace. And uh, many people have written in, can you tell me more about what kinds of boundaries I can have if I want to keep my job and I'm working for a manager or a boss who's a narcissist? So first I want to mention a little book that I think is really helpful for people in general. It's called um, Why Is It Always About Me by Sandra Hotchkiss. Subtitle, I think, The Seven Deadly Sins of Narcissism. And what's nice, folks, is it's a thin book, so you can read it quickly. And it talks about narcissism, but it also talks in particular about boundary setting with spouses, family members, bosses. So we'll cover some of that here, but in case we don't cover your specific situation, you may want to refer to that book. And then there's, of course, others, but that's a great place to start. Why is it always about you? So yeah, the workplace is different and it also depends on who's the narcissist. So if someone above you in the organization is a narcissist, there's not a whole lot that you can do um, because a lot of you know, confrontation with the narcissist will only sort of set them off often. It will make them more attacking, more angry, um, more vengeful. With uh, a, a subordinate or with a colleague, uh, there are boundary settings that you can do depending upon, again, how the narcissism is coming up. And it can come up in a bunch of different ways. It can come up with people talking inappropriately about personal stuff at the workplace. Then you may not need to establish a boundary around maybe we don't talk about these things at work. Or it could be the way that they complain or distract meetings, bring all the attention to themselves. And then if you're in a position of giving feedback, talking to the person about maybe being a little bit more um, aware of how much time they take in the meeting. Again, little things like this in certain situations can help someone with narcissistic tendencies sort of play more by the rules when the situation is not threatening to them and it's very time limited. Um, but it would be hard to get a narcissist to always listen to and feel into other people because that's just not their natural ability. But you might be able to say at our next staff meeting, could you just make sure you don't talk for more than five minutes? <laughs> um, again, these are made up, but the idea is anywhere we are, we have the chance to be able to find some level of how can I give myself a sense of safety? That's really what the boundaries are for. The boundaries are to help you feel like you have a line and you're not going to get harassed beyond that line. And some boundaries, you know, are suggestions to other people. Some boundaries are our own. Um, if you speak that way again to me, I'm going to walk out or I'm going to end this conversation. Um, 
that people who are narcissistic tend to, in inner office disputes, kind of go below the belt or get vicious or get reactive, um, just because, again, their nervous systems go very quickly into fight. And so once they're into fight and they're stirred up, there's not much you can do about that. It's more now about helping protect you or helping you feel that you have some more control in a relationship where you're actually given very, very, very little control. Jeffrey, one person wrote in, is narcissism a hereditary trait? And I think trying to understand like, what are the actual roots? Is it because of uh, the family I was raised in that I might become a narcissist? Or is it genetic? What's your understanding of this? I think it's a mixture of genetics and psychological experience and in certain instances, trauma. Uh, so we know that uh, trauma wounds the self and makes it very fragile. There's a certain percentage of trauma survivors who become abusers. Actually, that's the small minority of trauma survivors become abusers. But the ones who do tend to also show much more uh, narcissistic traits. Um, I think that there's a genetic predisposition and that influences also the brain's ability to easily access empathy. I think that there's actually a slight neurological difference in people with narcissism that it's harder for them to receive data about other people and process it. And I think that there's some people who um, have it for more purely psychological reasons trauma, wounding, other things early in life. Uh, and there's people who may have it more heavily weighed by genetics or a neurological shift. And so I think that will also determine what people are a little bit more workable and what people are not, which people are not. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say someone's listening to this and they're reflecting on the narcissists in their lives. I know I am reflecting on the narcissists that uh, I've experienced in my life. And they're wondering, have I suffered trauma at the, as a result, or was there just some stuff I have to work through? I don't really know. Like, what would, what would you say, oh, this would qualify? You'd be able to self-recognize, oh, this is trauma that I suffered. Well, it depends on how central this person was to your upbringing. If you had a narcissistic aunt or uncle that you saw once every year, you know, for a dinner at the house, and they were a jerk during that time, that would be unpleasant, but it's not going to impact your development, your sense of self. If the narcissistic individual is a primary caretaker, then that's going to leave you with some wounding, right? And um, one of the ways of looking at trauma is that it's wounding. So I think that anyone who's been in a significantly in a significant relationship with someone who is either a narcissist or has narcissistic tendencies, um, especially if they were younger, it's going to be very wounding. And it can also be significantly wounding, even if it's a relationship only once you're an adult. And a big part of the harm that comes from this, again, is, is how it diverts and perverts your own sense of self-worth. So it's not like you're getting slapped in the face. You're not getting injured in a way that you could show to someone else. The injury is happening so deep inside and it's twisting the way that you look at yourself so you're not even likely to tell anybody. Because what you're afraid you'd be telling them is, look, I'm a shit and my mom sees it. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think um, part of what I, I'd like to talk about more is in the healing trauma nine month deep dive program that you've created with Sounds True that begins at the end of January, you put a, a large emphasis on understanding trauma at the nervous system level. So I'd like to understand, first of all, uh, why, why this emphasis at, at the nervous system level and then what the healing path asks of us at the level of our nervous system? Great question. Um, 
when I first started treating trauma uh, back in the early 80s, uh, we weren't working with the nervous system. We were doing traditional talk therapy, and it was helping people. But what we found is that even after people deeply understood their triggers, what happened to them, were able to talk through some of their most painful memories and have a more coherent narrative, were able to grieve some of the losses, what they didn't receive in childhood, they were feeling better, they were more stable, they were able to be somewhat more present, but their nervous systems were still impacted by trauma. They would still have flashbacks and high levels of dysregulation. The biggest piece of work in the trauma field over the last 15 to 20 years has been the work about how do we work directly with the nervous system? How do we take away the traumatic impact that lives in someone's tissues and nervous system, which is the brain distributed throughout the body, keeps us in these states, these defensive states of fight, flight, freeze, or shutdown. And the biggest suffering, I believe, that's caused from trauma in general, and the biggest suffering that we have, even if you haven't had trauma, is the same, which is that we get sent into dysregulated states, we get rocketed into rage and fight energy, or we um, slink into fear and terror, or we shut down and need to take a nap or drink or smoke or do something to turn our minds off and to get away. And that we don't know why we're possessed by these strong feelings and we generally feel pretty impotent to try to change them, whether that's feeling depression, rage, anger, shame. So getting to work with the nervous system is a way of helping you feel comfortable and safe in the present. It's a skill that anybody can learn. Now, the program is not the same as psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is very individualized and there's a lot of processing and talking about the meaning of memories and events and also specifically sometimes the resistances people have to healing. In this program, what we're doing is we're teaching people basically the ins and outs of the nervous system, but specifically how to know when they're triggered, how to know when they're activated, how to identify what sent them there, how to identify the state they're in. Am I in hyperactivation, like fight or flight, or I'm in or am I in hypoactivation, like freeze and shutdown and collapse? Because it's helpful for us to be aware of where our nervous system is. That doesn't tell us, like Deb Dana says, it doesn't tell us who you are or what you are. Your nervous system tells you how you are. Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you relaxed? Are you safe? And so much of the time after trauma, we don't feel safe. We either now, Jeff, feel, Jeffrey, yeah. let me let me make it really real for someone. So let's say someone is right now listening to this and they know they will be interacting with a narcissist over the holiday season. They know it. It's going to be on a phone call with a family member uh, at a dinner or something like that. How would they identify at the nervous system level that a trauma has been triggered for them? And then once they're able to identify it, what can they do? So Let's dehook a couple of concepts. Um, I don't know if it'll trigger a trauma, but if you're in relationship with someone who has narcissistic tendencies <clears throat> and they're in a great mood, you may not get triggered at all. But if you start getting into patterns with them where you feel they're not understanding, they're being rigid, they're being unempathic, they're having expectations or being manipulative or exploitive of you, then that's likely going to trigger either a fight or flight response. So you're going to feel yourself worked up and energized, either tensing some muscles and wanting to lean into the fight, or you're going to feel some flight. I got to get out of here. I can't stand this. I knew it was going to be like this. This was a whole mistake. And you're going to want to leave. So just noticing either of those two mental and emotional storms let you know, oh, I'm, I'm stirred up by this. There's also another state you could get into, which is the shutdown state, the hypoactivation state. You may just find yourself getting really tired and needing to take a nap or needing to eat and then take a nap. 
that you just have to disengage because you feel so powerless to change them and the circumstances. All that you could do is turn off and hope the holidays pass. So if you notice any of these levels of activation, and it's easier to notice for most people activation to fight or flight than it is to shut down because um, that's a quieter uh, expression. So people may not have as much of a problem with it or feel as uncomfortable with it. But in any case, if you feel fight, flight, or shutdown, then just noticing that is the first step. And the second step would be to remind you why it's occurring. So instead of saying so-and-so is an asshole, it's a little bit more helpful to say, this is where they're limited in relationships. And what's really frustrating too when you're dealing with a narcissist is they will never agree with you that they're limited in relationships. So it's a place of you sort of have to um, be willing to hold your truth a bit in seeing the other for who they are and their limitations for what they are and that you want to try to reduce the amount of distress you feel. So you're going to feel some, if people are very narcissistic, you're going to feel some. The idea is, can you remove yourself from the situation? Can you not take the bait? And if you're in fight or flight, anything you can do to relax your nervous system is helpful. If you do meditation, doing some breath work, if you uh, run or go for a walk, any kind of physical exercise can do it. Something that helps shift you out of the agitation and the fight or flight response. That will help you return to a place where you'll have more latitude to sort of deal with other people's limitations. Now, Jeffrey, something else I'd love for you to offer a practical approach to right here is, is you mentioned, and uh, I thought you explained very clearly the connection between the shame we might feel, uh, feelings that somehow we're at fault, our own worth is in question, if we've uh, been uh, raised closely by people who are narcissists. And you said in your own experience and in the experience you people you work with, self-compassion is so important. Mm. And I wonder if you can offer us a self-compassion practice a perspective we can have if we notice our own uh, feelings questioning our own worth comes up so one of the first things you can do is if you're feeling and you can identify that you're feeling bad ashamed collapsing guilty less than not trusting your goodness one of the first things you can do is place one or both hands on your heart. And when you do that, see if you can allow your awareness to move into the body so that you feel the hands contacting the chest, have your awareness in the palms of your hands and sense what it feels like to make contact with your, sh your shirt and your sternum, heart region. And also allow your awareness to feel from your chest the comforting presence of your hands, the warmth, the pressure of the contact. Just doing this for a few moments can help you come back in. The other thing is, is it's really helpful if you're finding yourself stirred into shame or anger as a result of this, to name it and to allow some grace to soften towards it. This is okay. This is just humanity. All of us feel shame. All of us get upset. All of us go into fight or flight or shut down. There's nothing wrong with you know, Jeff, Jeffrey, something you said in this conversation that really got my attention, not only can we be compassionate towards ourselves, but you actually said a strategy is that we can experience compassion towards the narcissist. Mm -hmm. 
I thought that was a very bold and kind of breaks through a lot of the other, like, you know, pointing the finger, pointing the, you know, the, how, we're, we're so mad at this person and, you know, we want to shake them and get them to see the light. Tell me about that. How do we break through to actually feeling compassion for the narcissists in our lives? I think that, that there's a, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge mm -hmm. because we're so used to getting instinctively angry. Yeah. I think part of the reason for this is that a lot of us who either were raised by narcissists or were just raised well, have put in our own mm, shadow, the unowned, disowned parts of us, we have put in that box inside of us our own need for attention, our own desire to be seen. And so um, part of it is also being willing to be truthful with ourselves. Every one of us has the potential to uh, inhabit all of the narcissistic tendencies. The only thing that separates us from someone else doing it is, is the way that our nervous system is balanced and whether we can have an easier time moving into vulnerability and connection or whether we need to stay invincible and above others. But um, I was going to say something else. Compassion for the narcissists yeah. in our lives. So, so part, thank you. So understanding that we too have this capacity, right, lets us sort of honor that same tendency in these other people. So I, I still have narcissistic individuals in my life, and I love a bunch of them. Um, I see them um, as carrying a wound that they'll be unable to work on in this lifetime. And it makes me a bit sad, but I also have compassion because the experience for a narcissist is one of constantly trying to be okay, needing to make sure that everyone in the world sees them as better or good enough or special. It's unending. I mean, we all struggle, I think, with sense of self-worth and so forth, but narcissists aren't immune to that. They just don't ever express vulnerability, so we don't have much empathy for them. But if we can have empathy for our own struggles with wanting attention and disowning it, that's part of what fuels our judgment of narcissists. They're doing what we're not allowed to do, right? By convention, I don't want to you know, suck up all the air in the room. I want to be a, a person that makes room for other people. And we get angry when we think other people are just refusing to do that. That's part of what's going on. But another part of it at another level is they're just not aware. It doesn't come up on the radar. Mm -hmm. No, you know, I, I've noticed a theme coming in from the question. So I just want to make sure we uh, address it here before we close, which is it's a theme about I, I want to talk to the narcissists in my life, but I'm not sure I'm gonna get through. And you were pretty clear, Jeffrey, that if someone's on the far end, the narcissistic personality disorder, you know, be realistic, be sober, recognize you're not gonna get through. You may not even wanna try. But for people who maybe have narcissistic tendencies that we're in relationship with, and we wanna like knock on the door and have a discussion about narcissistic tendencies. What, what do you suggest? How do we know if there's an opening? How do we test if there's an opening? What kinds of ways might we be able to make a bridging conversation? So great questions. Um, so any of these discussions, uh, I would recommend number one, not having them ever in the middle of or immediately following a fight. Because if either one of you is still activated, it won't work at all. The ideal time to try to speak with someone who has narcissistic tendencies is when you're both pretty settled, you're both pretty regulated, you don't have something really pressing to do, it's not 11 o'clock at night or right before dinner, but you pick a time when you have a little bit of space to do this. The other thing is to remember that narcissists will listen to your words and I know I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing this, so forgive me, not every narcissist is like this, but often 
narcissist will be listening to hear, are you going to be criticizing them, insulting them, or saying that they've done something wrong, blaming them? And even if you don't, if they hear something that way, they'll react to that and only that out of everything you said. So pick a time that you're both regulated, where you don't have anything that's pressing, and then also enter the conversation from as much of a sense of caring and connection and kindness as you can. Because you're going to be treading into an area that will be very triggering for the narcissist. And so this is where you'll be able to tell, can we have a conversation and how much? Um, the best thing to do in that conversation would be, for example, be very concrete and don't be blaming. Um, you know, tonight at dinner, uh, I told you about this incident at work and how upsetting it was, and you didn't say anything. You didn't even react, and, and that hurt me. And what I could use in the future would be as if I say something, just acknowledge it so I, I feel less alone because I like it when we're to connect it, we're together. So I'm not saying, hey, you're a shit. I brought this up at dinner and you didn't say a friggin' thing and I hate you. That just gets more of the fight going. If I come in from a regulated place, a caring and friendly place, and I'm talking about what was in me, there's going to be less likelihood of triggering them. You still might. But mm -hmm. so I'm saying is that there's no uh, absolute rule book for this, but you can take steps like this and see, can they talk with me about one thing? And can they sort of hold this in their head so that next time they try to remember it? Or that, can we talk about, oh, you're doing that again. Can we uh, reset and try this over? And you'll see. But again, the movements that someone with narcissistic traits will make will be very small if they can make them. They may not be consistent. And for some people with narcissistic traits, like, look, I also had narcissistic traits. Because if you've been raised by a narcissist, you're also going to have that side. I put a lot of that in my shadow, but I still have to contend a lot with that too. I don't think I come across to the general public as a narcissist, but I still can battle that I can get over-involved in my own stuff instead of being connected to someone else's stuff. And that's the balance that we do. So having compassion for yourself, for what it's like to be in a relationship with a narcissist, having compassion for your shame, may also then allow you to move towards having some compassion for the other and then finding a way to have a conversation that sees if you can gently um, let the relationship walk towards healing. By the way, narcissistically individu individuals do not tend to go to individual therapy, but they will often come into marital therapy. And if you're in a couple, you, you there's a little bit more leverage of talking about the interactions between you than if someone with narcissistic tendencies is just in therapy alone, they'll tend most of the time, again, to talk about other people. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Thanks for your uh, great insight and your love, your great compassion as a person. I want to let everyone know that we will send out information about the replay. We had several questions. What were the nine traits that Jeffrey listed? You'll all get a link to the replay. I also want to let you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, that Jeffrey is the host of a new nine-month program that sounds true. He's put a lot of work in designing. How can we help people right now during this time heal from trauma, whether it's the trauma of narcissistic abuse, all kinds of trauma from early childhood at the personal level and also at the collective level. This mm -hmm. nine month program has some terrific teachers included. Uh, Deb Dana, who Jeffrey mentioned, who's an expert on the practical application of polyvagal theory. Uh, Thomas Hubel, who teaches on healing collective trauma. Gabor Mate, who looks at the connection between addiction and trauma. Peter Levine, who created the very well-known trauma healing methodology called somatic experiencing. Conda Mason, who will teach on self-compassion. The list goes on, 13 mm -hmm. different teachers 
uh, with Jeffrey as our anchor and host. Again, it begins at the end of January.